Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this session on human rights philosophy, where we're going to be discussing the introduction to what human rights are. How is everyone doing? Again. Good today, Jairo. How are you? It's a beautiful day. Great. <laughs> um, it is a beautiful day and it's a great day because, well, great particularly for this session, because we just came out a few days ago was International Youth Day. And it was talking about youth engagement for global impact. And this I consider to be a youth engagement. I'm very young. You all are part of a scholarship program for adolescent girls that aim to create a, a learning environment and an empowering environment where you will be the leaders and you will impact your communities. And with that, you have to have a clear understanding of what human rights are and the philosophy, the philosophy behind human rights. And anything that comes to your mind at all right now, what do you think human rights are? Just spit it out. Freedom. Freedom, yeah. Freedom of speech. That's a right, freedom of speech. Tatiana? Not there. Davia, Kristen? Certain privileges given to us that are enforceable by law. Certain privileges. Um, I like that you mentioned by law. Um, and that begs a question if all our rights are enshrined by law. And then if a right is not in law, then is it a right? And do we get it? Things like that we have to, sorry, yes, I, I see you wanted to comment on something. Kristen? Yes, I was just going to say, well, it ties in with morals too, so. So morals. And then who gets to determine human rights and morals? And then when we talk about human rights, and you, you did mention some things there, human rights are all about freedom. And as a human, as a person, it's certain privileges that we have and we are born with. So if we are born with something, can someone take that away from us? And uh, we must also discuss, as you mentioned, the morals behind human rights, who, who gets to create them, who gets to take them away, can they even be taken away? Who determines what is right from what is wrong if we're talking about morals and then what is the end of human rights why does why do they even exist this all encapsulate into what we understand of human rights philosophy and the basic line of what human rights are is that we are all born free human beings and equal free and equal human rights are certain privileges enjoyed just for you being a human being a person uh, you mentioned the freedom of speech. There's the freedom of being. There's the freedom of nationality. You are enjoying the freedom of education. You have the right to an education. Uh, there's a freedom to travel. Uh, and some may even argue that because you have a freedom of communicating and speech and all of that, internet and internet access is actually a freedom that everyone should have. It's a privilege that everyone should have. And then when we talk about privileges, we must also consider things like health care. You have a right to health care, but not everyone has that right. Do you understand that although we talk about free and equal, everyone has human rights. Do you understand that not everyone gets to enjoy those human rights? Let's discuss. Yeah, in some countries, persons, like um, let's say Islamic countries mostly, persons are not allowed to, especially females I should say, to dress how they feel, to like who they want to like, and some females are even forced to marry people they don't want to marry. Okay, so infringing on several rights there. They don't have the right to express themselves the way we understand them. So the freedoms to do it or even decisions. They don't have the right to make decisions over their own bodies like marriage. Okay, um, that's a great example. Um, anyone else? Yes, yeah, some people fine. do not have... Oh, I'm sorry. It's fine. Kayla? Yeah, I was about to say, I feel like right here, children don't have the kind of freedom that they should um, to speak because parents especially believe that, okay, I am older, so I'm 
superior and you're inferior, so you shouldn't be speaking. Unfortunately, that is true. That some children, um, well, human rights abuses and violations in Guyana are at a very surprising rate. And we did mention that in our course where we did on violence against women and sexual and gender-based violence. You must consider the dire statistics that come with it, like sexual abuse being the number one form of violence. Uh, one out of every four women in Guyana would experience some form of sexual abuse or harassment. And then you must consider that we have the second highest rate of teenage pregnancy in the region. So certain rights there are being violated, right to access health care, right to education, right to judicial services. And of course, even the right to express oneself and make decisions over their own bodies. And as common as saying, you know what, children must be seen and not heard, is violating that right for a child to express themselves. And you know, we all know it in this uh, room here. That is something every Guyanese child at one point in their life would have heard. And it's not only in their household, it's even in the schools. In schools, we're all forced to face one direction, which is the blackboard. And then there's an authoritative figure that stands there and basically stands over and dictates over the classroom and only they must talk. And that if you have an opinion or a different perspective, you have to sort of have their permission to express it. And it goes to children having rights and that we must uphold it. But then it, it comes back to thinking now, and Kristen, I know you wanted to speak. So um, I'm just gonna throw this point here. It comes back to when do we empower young people to challenge those rights? That's a question there. Kristen? I was just going to talk about how the some economies affect rights too, because some people don't have access to certain things such as health care. While it is a right, they may not have access to it. And that is so true. Um, in Guyana, we see there's not equality to access to health care because most hospitals and services are at the city and coastline, while rural areas and indigenous villages don't have the same access to health care. But it's more than just economy, although socioeconomical impacts do play a part with who has access, but it's also politics because in countries like the United States, they have the economy to give health care to everyone, but their politics basically prevents that. They do not have public health care. You have to have insurance in order to have affordable health care. And sometimes those insurance, they're not affordable. So it goes to politics, society, environment, and economy. And all of that wraps into the philosophy of human rights. I'm going to ask, well, I'm going to show a video and then I want us to discuss who does not have human rights? And it's a bit of a thinker, but it's a question that will come, especially when you work with communities. The idea of human rights is that each one of us, no matter who we are or where we are born, is entitled to the same basic rights and freedoms. Human rights are not privileges and they cannot be granted or revoked. They are inalienable and universal. That may sound straightforward enough, but it gets incredibly complicated as soon as anyone tries to put the idea into practice. What exactly are the Everyone, I'm going to pause the video. Can you hear it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Sorry. Okay, playing again. <laughs> the basic human rights. Who gets to pick them? Who enforces them? And how? The history behind the concept of human rights is a long one. Throughout the centuries and across societies, religions, and cultures, we have struggled with defining notions of rightfulness, justice, and rights. But one of the most modern affirmations of universal human rights emerged from the ruins of World War II with the creation of the United Nations. The treaty that established the UN gives as one of its purposes to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights. And with the same spirit, in 1948, the UN General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
This document, written by an international committee chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt, lays the basis for modern international human rights law. The Declaration is based on the principle that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. It lists 30 articles recognizing, among other things, the principle of non-discrimination and the right to life and liberty. It refers to negative freedoms, like the freedom from torture or slavery, as well as positive freedoms, such as the freedom of movement and residence. It encompasses basic civil and political rights, such as freedom of expression, religion, or peaceful assembly, as well as social, economic, and cultural rights, such as the right to education and the right to freely choose one's occupation and be paid and treated fairly. The Declaration takes no sides as to which rights are more important, insisting on their universality, indivisibility, and interdependence. And in the past decades, international human rights law has grown, deepening and expanding our understanding of what human rights are and how to better protect them. So if these principles are so well developed, then why are human rights abused and ignored time and time again all over the world? The problem, in general, is that it is not at all easy to universally enforce these rights or to punish transgressors. The UDHR itself, despite being highly authoritative and respected, is a declaration, not a hard law. So when individual countries violate it, the mechanisms to address those violations are weak. For example, the main bodies within the UN in charge of protecting human rights mostly monitor and investigate violations, but they cannot force states to, say, change a policy or compensate a victim. That's why some critics say it's naive to consider human rights a given in a world where state interests wield so much power. Critics also question the universality of human rights and emphasize that their development has been heavily guided by a small number of mostly Western nations to the detriment of inclusiveness. The result? A general bias in favor of civil political liberties over socio-political rights and of individual over collective or groups' rights. Others defend universal human rights laws and point at the positive role they have on setting international standards and helping activists in their campaigns. They also point out that not all international human rights instruments are powerless. For example, the European Convention on Human Rights establishes a court where the 47 member countries and their citizens can bring cases. The court issues binding decisions that each member state must comply with. Human rights law is constantly evolving, as are our views and definitions of what the basic human rights should be. For example, how basic or important is the right to democracy or to development? And as our lives are increasingly digital, should there be a right to access the internet? A right to digital privacy? What do you think? All right, so what is your big takeaway on human rights philosophy? That even though we have all these rights, that you still can't exactly enforce them and have it be punishable because some things there that I noticed was the right to a free trial. Given the history of, you know, Black people being accused of certain things in America, they never got a free trial and were often per, um, prosecuted wrongly. Then I also saw the right to marry freely and, and start a family, I, bet, I believe, like marry who you want. Mm -hmm. While in so many countries around the world, including Guyana, same-sex marriage is still outlawed and punishable. So, but... The thing is that nothing can exactly be done to rectify this because it's not a law, it's just a declaration, even though these are all fundamental human rights. Great, great takeaway. I love that. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it is a philosophy, it is a concept, but it is mentioned that in some places they've taken it a step further to actually have human rights courts that can be can enforce these policies and laws. Um, you mentioned right to a free trial. 
Um, the only example I could think of when you talk about Black persons in the United States was um, during the Jim Crow era, um, just after slavery, and even during the civil rights uh, movement where Black persons were taken and they were not tried, they were just hung by the neck or killed for crimes. And if anyone have read the book To Kill a Mockingbird, you would have like seen a very clear example of what was going on at the time. But it's important to note that our modern understanding of human rights was established in 1948. Um, and that was just three years or yeah, a couple of years after World War II had ended and the United Nations was formed. And in another video, I'm going to show you why those rights were formed, the importance of rules and the importance of that time. Thank you very much for that takeaway. Um, something else you mentioned. So we don't have the right to marry freely, to have um, our own families and make decisions about ourselves and sexualities. That is very much true in today and Guyana being an example of one of the countries that do not recognize the right for adults to have uh, same sex consensual relationships, meaning that the rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans persons are not recognized fully. Uh, why well, say fully? Because it, de it depends on what sort of rights you're looking for. And discrimination, violence, bullying, and harassment are also violations of someone's rights because they don't get to exercise and live their lives freely. Remember the first right we mentioned, you are born free and equal. And that goes to the discussion I wanted to have with you who does not have rights. Does anyone else want, um, want to share your takeaway based on that video? All right. Uh, based on that, I, I wrote some notes here. So what's something my takeaway is that no rights are more important than the other that was mentioned human rights are interdependent on each other they all if you take away one right you are taking away other rights and they're intersectional so when we talk i remember your course you did on it was with a Cola thompson you did can anyone remind me it was on gender women feminism. and gender in society yes on feminism so she spoke about intersectional feminism um, so when talk about women and gender in society, you have to discuss that one woman, it's several other things. Um, she's a black woman, she can be a queer woman, she can be a rural woman, she could be an indigenous woman, she could be an industrious woman, she could be a stay-at-home mom, it's several things. That does not mean that she's not this one thing. Human rights are the same thing. If you talk about quick, uh, Kristen, give me a right, any right. The right to an education. The right to an education. If you do not, if you take away someone's right to an education, you're taking away someone's right to express themselves. You're taking away someone's right to have resources and a job. You're taking away someone's right to equality, social equality. You're taking away someone's right to health care because they can't afford health care. You're taking away so many other rights, including their freedom of expression, because in a room full of dialogue makers and policy makers, they're not treated the same as everyone else because you've taken away one right, it's a domino effect of you are going to take away several other rights. Do you understand that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, something else I want to mention before I go into the other video is that um, human rights and the human right, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is just that. It's all these states that came together and say, yes, we agree that these are the fundamental human rights, but states do abuse them. Um, communities do abuse them and there are persons who violate them. In that regard, it's not even an international law, it's just an international agreement. And even with international laws, there are really no court set up to hold states accountable to violating these laws. I will give you one example and I want you to mention any other examples you can think of right here in Guyana. A few years ago, um, a young man was taken by the police and he was tortured for answers. And the police threw gas on his genitals and lit it a fire and burnt him. He was under the age of 18, so he, he was not an adult, it was a child. And the story came out, they tried to hide it for most of the time, but the media published it and it became an entire court story. That is a clear violation of someone's right, correct? My question to you is, had that not been published, had that not went out into the media, do you think that 
people are going to mobilize to talk about that being a human rights violation? No, I don't think they would have. Because, like, it would have stayed within the, like, within with, with the people that it happened to. And the boy who it happened to, he would have been so traumatized. He would have been afraid to talk about it. So it would not have been, you know, publicized and people would not have really taken a stance on it being a human rights violation. Okay, great. Thank you, Taya. And that is exactly it. And that is why the responsibility of watching for human rights violations and reporting it is all on every one of us. We cannot wait on a court to be established, nor can we wait for the right person or the media to publish it. We must constantly be vigilant on when one person's rights are being abused. And that goes to the entire premise on what the Black Lives Matter movement is about. It's not to say just Black people deserve rights or working towards their rights. It's that we recognize that Black persons are more to disadvantage in their society and communities because of racial discrimination. So we all have to hold the system accountable to their actions. And every one of you in this program, you have to watch your communities to know which rights are being violated. And to do that, you need to recognize these rights because sometimes they're not that clear. And sometimes because there are no laws that govern it, and sometimes the laws are opposing what you believe are human rights, you must really think of the morality of what is good for all and your community rather than just one person or one religion or even that one community. You must think about what's all for the greater good of humanity. So that's why human rights are universal. It applies to every culture, every race, every class, everyone. Can you please tell me of examples of human rights violations that you can think of that has happened in Guyana or in the Caribbean? Christy? Um, Jerry, could you repeat the question, the question, please? Okay. Can you think of any human rights violations that happened in Guyana or in the Caribbean region? Um, I think we mentioned a few, but are you talking about besides those? Anything you can think of, any human rights violations you can think of. Um, freedom to choose who you would like to be with. It's like, for me, that's something I really want them to look past. It's not even just the justice system. It's not the government. It's like people within Guyana because, yes, they're going to um, pass the law. Sure, you could be with who you want to be with. Um, anybody violates that right, they're going to be charged. But I think people are still going to violate that, that right. And a lot of people won't complain because there's so many Guyanese people and Caribbean in general that think it's wrong. It goes against the Bible. Um, they pass and don't judgment on people. And even mm -hmm. though the Bible clearly says don't do that, everybody does that in the Caribbean or most people I should say. So that comes to LGBT rights. And since we're on the topic, let me discuss it here. So people like to think that LGBT rights are special rights afforded to just gay people and lesbians and bisexual, trans persons, queer persons, intersex persons, plus. It is a sexual and reproductive right. But here's the thing. We did mention this. One right is not more equal than the other. One group of persons are not more equal than the other. When we talk about LGBT rights, we're talking, and when we talk about Black rights, Black lives and Black right, lives matter, we're talking that if we're all supposed to be on one sphere, we must recognize that LGBT persons are treated like this when everyone else is treated like this. We are considering that Black people are treated like this when everyone else is treated like this. We're talking about Indigenous people are treated like this when everyone else. The thing about um, LGBT rights, Indigenous rights, Black rights, every other aspect of rights when you hear a movement, including women's rights, is to pull those disadvantaged communities to be equal to everyone else. And in the session that we did when we were talking about women and gender in society and women's rights and feminism, the feminist movement, is that there's no such thing as women being more equal to men or than men. It's about bringing women to the standards that men have been comfortable living throughout their entire lives. When we talk about LGBT rights, you mentioned the same thing. We can change the laws today to say that um, everyone, regardless of who they are, should be allowed to have sexual uh, intercourse with an adult that they feel comfortable with and who gives consent. By the end of the day, you will have a section society that will still discriminate against them, even though that law is there. 
We have dozens of laws. We have an entire, um, is it oh, the Amerindians, um, Amerindians Affairs Act in Guyana? It's basically an uh, act of law that governs how we treat and how we integrate indigenous persons into general Guyanese society. And yet we still discriminate against indigenous people. We can have all the laws, we have all these laws about gender equality and about um, parliamentary representation of women on list, on the parliamentary list. And we have about bringing women towards um, employment equality, but we still harass women and treat them as if they're not equal to us. So that's a very good point you raise, that it's not just about laws and legal change, it's about social change. It's about how we as a community can better understand ourselves. And with that comes education. I always say social development requires social learning, and that's why we have this program, that we all must learn as a society with our different backgrounds, our different cultures, and we must come to the understanding that in order to progress as a society, you have to work towards society by learning about each other and learning differences and finding energy and power in those differences. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else want to contribute to this piece before we move on to the next video and the next discussion? Um, there is the right to um, unfair detainment, like no unfair detainment. Where like as in in Guyana before like I think like around 2016, 2018, people would often get unfair detainment for marijuana possession, where people would get like years and years for um just like a very small amount, which doesn't which shouldn't really be and doesn't really make sense. Like yes, it's illegal, but such a small amount on a person shouldn't have such a heavy price. Yeah, um, very much true. And it's not only the small amount is that we can see a clear difference towards uh, judicial service, uh, but basically what we call justice. Um, many times we think about the United States as an example of these violations um, because of what they've went through as a state and what they're going through now. Um, the, for example, I can't remember his name, and if any one of you can, feel free to just tell me. There was a young man who had committed rape against a young lady. I think his name is Brock, Brock something. And Brock Turner. Brock Turner. Brock Turner. And he basically got a slap on the wrist and got sent home. And the, the, the testimonies, they said it was one of the most horrifying things that they've ever seen when they saw the state of that young lady. And she was devastated. It, the entire situation was devastating. And because he was a white American uh, with certain privileges, and because he's a, a swimmer and an award-winning swimmer partly, they were like, as jail sentence is going to be too hard on him. We're just going to give him community service. But for a Black person, they would have practically go through a horrid judicial system. The media was going to blast them. Um, things that they've done five years ago and their ancestors that um, family members would have done would have come up and then they would have gotten life imprisonment. So you can see a clear difference between, and we see it in Guyana all the time. Um, and it's a social class thing. So for the upper class who have, who have access to money and good lawyers basically get community service for a small amount of marijuana and no jail sentence. But for the persons who live in impoverished communities or for rural persons or black persons, if they got caught with a small amount of marijuana, they're thrown in jail for seven years. But it's not only jail for seven or 15 years, but sometimes uh, they have to go through something called remand where they're actually thrown in prison until their next court date, but they've actually never been sentenced because they've never been proven guilty. But they're stuck in the court system. They're stuck in the prison system until they're proven guilty. And that happens for years upon years, up to five years, people are still in prison because the, um, the police were not able to find them guilty, but the case is still in court. That is an injustice against someone's rights. I mean, no one deserves that. I mean, that's taken away their right to freedom, the right to a fair trial, the right to justice. Thank you very much for sharing that. So for this other video to discuss, where is it? We're gonna be looking at just a short thing of human rights and the history of it. And I particularly like this, it's kind of fast paced and moving. So um, 
If you're taking notes, great. Let's discuss from that. Nineteen forty-eight rings a bell. Hmm. Oh yes, of course. It was in the last century, Grandma and Grandpa's generation. Legend has it that there were still dinosaurs hiding in caves up in the mountains. But that is something we're really not sure of at all. Back then, everyone was recovering from the Second World War and its 70 million dead, the most devastating conflict in human history. So in 1948, to make sure such atrocities would not happen again, the search for shared values began. Why? Have people unite around a strong symbol, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What is less known is that it was adopted by the UN General Assembly and has become the most translated text on Earth. But what are human rights? The rights you are entitled to simply because you are a human being. In other words, everyone benefits from them from birth, without exception or distinction. The idea behind it is that these rights are like needs. They are absolutely necessary to live well. Without them, it would be the law of the jungle, and you'd risk being beheaded if your government didn't like your Facebook status. In the Declaration's 30 articles, there are the civil and political liberties, such as the right to life, the right to vote, freedom of expression, or the prohibition of slavery and torture. Rights are interdependent, indivisible, and interrelated. This means that if a right is not respected, a series of other rights won't be either. If you are homeless, you live in the streets, so you can't sleep. You get sick, you don't go to school, and won't find a job. Violation of the right to adequate housing triggers the violation of the right to rest, the right to education, the right to work, etc. These are economic, social, and cultural rights. Okay, so a great text was agreed upon, but who does what? Well, on paper, the state's mission is to take the necessary measures for the declaration to be respected. But in reality, <coughs> there are some very bad students. The declaration is not a legislative text. It's an ideal. Its name says it all. It is a declaration. Therefore, it is not valid in a court of law. But most states have integrated human rights in their constitution, and therefore, they must guarantee them. You can defend human rights only if you know them. Everybody's role is to ensure they are respected. Collective conscience means that each and every person is responsible for everybody else's well-being. Therefore, we can all get involved, protest against injustices, and make the universal rights ideal succeed. All right. So in that video's takeaway is basically just a brief history of why those rights exist since um, you all would be familiar of World War II and how devastating the war and its impact had on the, in the globe. Uh, one example of that would be in Germany, um, under the Hitler regime, you were persecuted for your religion. So the Jews were killed in thousands. Um, homosexuals were also killed. Black people were killed. Um, persons from different nations were killed and then there was a war surrounding that and the major violations of the rule of well, the rules of war. Um, so in total millions of people were killed and millions more were displaced as in they were moved out of their homes and their rights violated. They couldn't go to the same schools, they couldn't go into certain institutions and they were forced out of their land. Not only that, halfway across the world there was this another war, another aspect of the war, but same World War II. Um, the Japanese were invading the uh, China and the China, the China Sea. And what they've done is that they've violated what we call a common law of war, which is that actually they didn't violate it, the US did. Okay, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. You all know of this story. So Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, which follows the laws of war. You are only supposed to attack a military base. You can't attack civilians. But the US retaliated by bombing two cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is actually violating the laws of war, you're not, which is you're not supposed to attack civilian places, schools, hospitals, innocent persons in cities that are not involved in the fight, you're not supposed to attack. But the US put two nuclear bombs bombed out an entire city. So the wars were very devastating in all corners of the globe. And when it finally ended in 1945, every country agreed that we cannot afford another war and we need to start respecting each other and we need some sort of guiding principle on how we must live 
in our differences. And that's why in that video, we heard that people needed to surround themselves. They needed a symbol that they can all agree to. And that is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's all about shared values. So yes, we mentioned that some countries like Middle Eastern and Islamic countries don't necessarily share the same values like European and the Northern countries. But because we want to look about everyone being equal and at least having the same basic needs and rights, this is why this declaration is there. And it did mention that it's a right and need that has existed. Um, what are your takeaways or what do you want to discuss based on that video? Jordana? Um, what I took away from it is that it's kind of hard for a regular person like myself to um, make an impact on changing a law or enforcing a new law because I see something as wrong. I have to have like a bunch of voices backing me up and probably somebody high up backing me up to actually get the change that I want because it seems as though it's just like the people in high places that could make these laws. They're like, um, for instance, if children being beaten at home as here in Ghana, that's like a norm and somebody high up if they if they're accustomed to it they don't see a problem with it I can't do anything about that me and all the other people that see a problem with that we really can't do much against that because majority of the citizens in Ghana accept that and that person that's in a place to change it accepts that so that's basically what I took away from that video thank you thank you very much for sharing that anyone else uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, Kristen, then Tahila. Yes. So what I took away was when they said that you can only defend yourself if you know the basic human rights. So I think now that it's basically that we have to all educate ourselves because if we don't know and someone is violating a right we wouldn't be able to defend or help ourselves and mm -hmm. that we have to look out for each other because when injustices are happening perhaps i know a right and someone else doesn't know it and we i can tell them that their right is being violated that we can start protests protests against injustices and help each other out i think that was very important and i really liked that about the video Thank you for sharing. And indeed, that is it. And I did mention that we are educating you on your rights, that you're empowered to be part of that change in your community. Um, because with that knowledge, applying that knowledge, you would be amazed at the impact that you can make. Thank you very much. I love that. That's the takeaway you had. Um, something I just wanted to mention in the video, uh, she did say that some states incorporate those rights and laws into their constitutions and local laws. Um, Guyana is one of those states. So um, I can't remember their names exactly. I will share that with you after this session. Um, but the laws are the International, Con okay, the International Convention on uh, Women and on Indigenous People and the Rights of Children are directly incorporated into our constitution. So it's considered the supreme law. If we are to go to court, we can actually defend those international law as being part of local law because we've incorporated directly into our local law and not just any local law, it's the highest law of the land. So again, it's one such state as I've mentioned, one and two of those. All righty. Um, Tehila. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my takeaway would be that the one one of the most important things I I saw in the video was that the violation of one human right leads to the violation of many other human rights. In the example that they give, um, if you're homeless and you're living on the street, that's a violation of your right to shelter. And then if you're on the street, then you're not getting arrested, and that's a violation of your right to rest. So that was one thing that I took away from the um the video. Okay. Alrighty, thank you very much. And I um, wanna go back, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, all right, I have, I have a question. So in the video I said, um, 
there's a right to housing, right? However, there are homeless people. I mean, it's not always the government's fault if somebody's homeless. It could be your own personal fault. But I was wondering if, like, they're supposed to intervene and take people off the road and actually give them um, temporary housing and so on. Is that, like, something they're supposed to do? Or Yes. So it is a responsibility of the state to uphold your human rights. Uh, so that includes if someone is homeless, the state must be able to provide some sort of shelter for you. And in Guyana, we have several um, shelters for homeless persons. They just choose to enact their right to not be there. Some of them. Um, there are many cases oh. where the homeless okay. persons are taken. There's a home in Mahaika, the Hugo Chavez Center for the Homelessness, something of that sort. Um, it can have a capacity of like 80 homeless persons, but they get away. Some persons get away, but there are homes for them. And we, we have something called the night shelter in Guyana. Um, it's basically if you run away from home or if you find yourself needing temporary shelter, you just um, apply to the Ministry of Social Protection and they put you there until they can relocate you. So it, it's the state's responsibility oh. to protect your rights. Um, similarly, like, for example, saying you have a right to education, everyone has a right to education. It's a state responsibility to make sure that those rights are upheld. That's why they have to build schools. When you say you have the right to health care, that's an individual right, yes, but it's the state's responsibility to build hospitals and clinics so that you can access those rights. Understood? Yeah, I was wondering, because I was thinking um, there are so many people on the road the government isn't doing anything about this and I always want to know if there, there are places for them to go because somebody told me there's help and shelter mm -hmm. something like that yeah. but a lot of persons are infected with TB there and so persons try not to go there so um, I have not heard about that um uh, help and shelter is it's not government run it's a non-government organization that has support from the government so oh. and it's for women and girls who have been women and children actually who have been in domestic violence situations and who have been abused and who ran away from home to seek temporary shelter away from their abuser before going to the police and court um, but they have a responsibility to make sure everyone that they're keeping is safe from harm and also healthy so that they don't infect other people. But services just like that, it's not just the government's responsibility to uphold our rights. It's every one of our responsibilities. And we did discuss this, that although we may know our rights, someone else may not, and we have to make sure that their rights are upheld. And that's why we, in this program, we had sessions on sexual and gender-based violence and abuses and domestic violence. Um, everything to deal with women empowerment and really to address your community concerns. And of course, in your program, you're going to have to develop a community awareness or volunteerism project where you're gonna to have to address if you see inequality, something that needs to change in your community and work towards it. Because as I mentioned, everyone and every community has something that can change and it's just for us to be knowledgeable and to create strategies that would be able to change it. That's basically most of the discussion I wanted to have with you. I don't know if there's anything that you want me to touch on. Anyone? All right. So I hope you do understand the history, the brief history there, the philosophy of why human rights exist and what really they are, and why we must work towards a society that upholds the rights of everyone. And I will go back to the question I asked you guys, and I will always ask people this question, because we need to think about our own prejudice and our own ways of how we may not necessarily think of all humans as being equal. So my question to you is, who... Which person does not have human rights or should not, do not deserve rights? Uh, I believe that, um, I'll repeat the question for Trinity. Um, in our society, who do you think do not deserve human rights? Uh, I believe that, um, Everybody has 
human rights and to have human rights. But however, his human rights of freedom is going to be taken away because he he's done something that so in that case he doesn't right and the law has the right to take that human right away from him he has violated um in some way the law can take away rights do you think the law should have that power to take away human rights um, can I add to what Tehila said? Um, I think when somebody commits a crime, they're still human at the end of the day. You're going to prison. Prison should be a correctional place. It should be working towards making that person better than when they actually um, got into prison. It's as when I see prison, like in movies or like those shows about being in prison, Yes, you're punishing them. You're taking away certain privileges, phone and that stuff, right? But it's like, to me, they make it, they make that person worse. They turn them, you could probably go in there for petty theft and you are mixed with all these different criminals and these people are treating you rough and extremely bad and taking away all your privileges to sometimes even proper health. And it's like they're, T turning you into a monster more than actually helping you and when you get out of prison you're a better person but most times people come out and they're worse because that's what prison did to them so I don't think anybody should actually have their rights taken away they should still have their rights there they should still be treated like a person so that when they come out they're gonna act like a decent human being and treat everyone the same thank you very much um <laughs> Um, excuse. No, Trinity. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, considering what she just said, I also agree because I don't think, considering we're all human and we all have rights, I don't think anyone should have the uh, um the authority or the right to take away other people's human rights. Considering we're all of the same species, same blood. Well not same blood group but same blood and we all are, are we're all practically made of the same thing except thank genders you. so yeah <laughs> thank you trinity uh yeah. Dianti. um good afternoon um what the girls are saying is correct but in my opinion i believe that as humans and you're saying that we're all made of the same thing and whatever i think we all have a self-consciousness um for rapists I cannot understand how um, somebody can rape an, uh, a little child, an eight-year-old child. I strongly believe that, yes, we do all deserve human rights and, and stuff like that. But in cases like these where somebody is supposed to know that these things are wrong, I, in my opinion, I think that um, prison is the right place for them. And even though... Um, um, what Daniel was saying that how it should correct it should be a place of correction and stuff like that yes it should be a place of correction but that is what that person deserves to go to prison and maybe the treatment isn't that um right and stuff like that but I de I think they deserve to have at least some of their human rights taken away because how can you in your right mind rape an innocent child and think that you know you don't deserve certain treatment or um going to prison um you know for that amount of time or whatever I just strongly believe that in cases like those those persons just need to accept whatever treatment comes to them because in that case where you could be related to that innocent girl or you could it could happen to anybody else but in those cases where rapists they sh I think they should have uh self-consciousness they should um come to this place to say well it is wrong they should. They deserve to be in prison. They deserve to have certain treatment towards them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dianti, for being. Um, I love. Ah, oh, go right ahead. I, I go. Oh. You, you're, you're leading this okay. discussion. Go ahead. While I do agree with what Dianti said, that you know they do deserve to be imprisoned, I also agree with Danielle because. 
there are some people that turn criminals simply because of trauma, because of certain things that they have been through. There are certain people with mental illnesses and to put them in prison and not try to better them to release them back into society. I mean, there are some people that simply cannot change. We've discussed this already. There are some people that cannot change because they do not want to change. And if you have tried enough and you see this person is not changing, well, fine, leave them in a prison. But to take away someone's human rights is simply inhumane. Who are we to decide that, well, your rights should be stripped of you? Like, it's, it's simply inhumane. Like, I don't, I don't believe in that. So it's inhumane okay. to take away someone's human rights. Okay. So, um, Daryl, adding again, um, Dan, he's actually correct. Like, let's think about it. People commit crimes. People steal. They probably steal. They're hungry or something. They don't have a job. And then they resort to this. It's wrong. But that's the best they could do for, for them, you should say. And then there are people that murder and not murder because um, they want to kill somebody. Sometimes they're, it's self-defense. Um, sometimes they do it out of um, provocation or somebody basically... Um, pushing them to that point or something like that, which is not right. But why does somebody rape somebody? If there's absolutely no reason for somebody to actually rape somebody. There's, there's literally, that's something that you're doing for your own personal pleasure. Like a lot of rapists, I've listened to interviews and stuff like that. They're doing it because that's what kick gets them off or some of them don't even see anything wrong with forcing somebody to have sex with them. So Diane, she's right. As a rapist is somebody that you need to take away some amount of right from that person. That's especially persons that rape children. Hila? Uh, I've listened to what everyone has had to say, uh, Deontay and Danielle and everybody. All I want to say is, most times in most situations, well, I shouldn't even say most, but what when you're sent to prison, you're there because you have violated some aspect of the constitution of the country. So from the time you are sentenced, I know there are a lot of times you are wrongfully imprisoned, falsely imprisoned and all of that. But most times if you're sent to prison, that's because you have violated something against the constitution of that specific country. From the time you're sentenced, your free your your right to freedom is from them on taken away for a period of time. If it's for life, then that's forever. Your freedom of your freedom of uh, freedom of movement is is taken away. I do believe that in a case with um petty crimes, when you I think Daniel mentioned this when you go to the um when you go to prison, it's supposed to be like a correctional facility where you're supposed to come out as a better person. I believe that is true, but it all depends on what you're going in for. Because if you're going to jail for having a low marijuana or something, then yeah, there is hope for your for a, 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 a petty robbery or something like that. Then yeah, you go in there for to receive correction. But if you're going there as a serial killer or something like that, then I believe, yes, you are human. I respect the fact that you are human, but men, uh, your human, your human rights should be taken away in some sense. Okay. Someone else wanted to contribute. All right. So. Thank you very much for that discussion. My, my takeaway based on everything you have discussed, and I wrote some notes here. I playfully wrote Diante versus everyone else because Diante did come passionate with her views and they're not wrong. Uh, everyone else's views are not wrong either because here's the thing. Um, we do need prison reform. For one, I personally do not believe you should even be jailed for marijuana because many countries are legalizing it. It's literally a herb that people smoke. People have smoked it for years, for thousands of years, human civilization. How can you smoke marijuana and, not, and how can you criminalize marijuana but not tobacco? 
So uh, both of them are herbs, or both of them are plants that you, you prepare and, and you put in a little thing and you smoke it. I, I don't smoke, but I don't see why people are you know being thrown in jail because marijuana has literally never enticed someone to hurt someone else it's never proved it was it's, never it's proved. probably because like it, it causes someone to get high and people and because of like you know other narcotics and 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 illegal drugs get people it, high so like you put all of that for the same group Basically. That is essentially why it was made illegal. Um, the U.S. started a war on drugs and marijuana and, fit into what they cate- uh, categorize as drugs. And, and the um, thing about... Oh, continue. And, and, and the thing about it is that the hemp plant is actually very helpful and more sustainable than most like actual like products we use because like hemp can be used to build houses and all these things. But, you know, people aren't really getting on it because it comes from the marijuana plant and all of that. So, yes, there's a huge stigma against marijuana. There when really is, that's and, very that, plant. and that is why we look at people who smoke and we throw people in prisons for smoking marijuana because the stigma attached to it. So that's a whole debate we're not going to go into. Should people who, should it even be illegal? However, why I brought it up is because you're, you're right to say that laws, they should make sense. They should come from a sensible place. For example, in another session, we spoke about the cross-dressing law and how ridiculous it was and that it was never really defined and that's why it was thrown out. Um, it was struck down from our laws, the cross-dressing law. Um, prisons need to be reformed. And to reform prisons, you need to reform the justice system because the justice system does not treat everyone equally, although it should. And law sometimes is not, uh, per, it's not handed down blindly. It should be. Like the literal imagery of what the justice system is, it's a woman who is supposed to be fair, holding a scale. The scale is well balanced because it's fair. And she has a blindfold on because justice is blank. It doesn't look to see who has money, who is black, who is indigenous. It's supposed to be blank. It's supposed to equally be handed down to everyone but it's not so. So in order to change the prison system, we need to change the justice system. Um, so we need reforms. And I will agree with the everyone else. Um, remember I mentioned it's Diati versus everyone else. Um, and to, to say that, uh, I will agree in the sense that law, um, human rights are not necessarily taken away. They're suspended. And when they're suspended and you're put in prison, it is to develop you into a better person now when you've come. It's supposed to be um, a reformative social program. And our former minister of public security, Kamran Tramjitan, he once said that small criminals go into the prison system and graduate into bigger criminals because they go in there for three years and they come out harder criminals with a network. That they've, they've, that they've created in the prison. And they have all sort of friends and that all sort of plans and things that they create. I remember prison toughens you up to be in that environment instead of teaching you that when you eventually come out, how you can contribute to society. So the point of prison is to take people away from society as a form of punishment. It suspends their freedom of um of freedom of movement it ex- it suspends a lot of freedoms but it's not supposed to take those freedoms away which comes to discussion of do prisoners deserve rights do rapists deserve rights do child molesters deserve rights the, the answer really is yes everyone deserves human rights however the law can suspend rights the law should not be able to take away rights but there are some laws and there are some countries who empower their laws to take away rights. For example, the right to life. There are some countries and some states in the United States that enforces the death penalty. If you've committed a certain act, you're sentenced to death and that is taking away the right to life. I disagree with that. I don't think anyone, any entity, any state should have that right to take someone's life away. You can put them into prison let them um, you isolate them from society, have reformative programs. And even in prison, you're supposed to have programs that will still make persons contribute to society, whether it be um, uh, some prisons do 
um, outsourcing services, you know, like there's teleperformers and call funds. Some prisons have that system where the prisoners themselves are the ones you're talking to. Some prisons, they make number plates. Other prisons make uh, documents and stuff like that. Um, other prisons do like this. Um, this So you can still contribute to society while being isolated from society. I don't believe you should take away someone's rights at all at all you should not have the right to take someone's right away well and that is something okay. just not here that's something that um to discuss when especially talking about lgbt rights and why they should not have rights the thing is about rights is that and even the rights to expression everyone likes to say i have the right to express myself that is not exactly true you can express yourself as long as your right of expression does not infringe on the rights of other people. So I do not have the right to say that black people do not have rights. That's infringing on their rights. That's discriminating against them. I do not have the right to say LGBT persons should be killed. That is discriminating against them and harassing them. That is infringing on their rights. I do not have the right to infringe on the rights of other people. And that is why the state should not have the right to take someone's life away. That is why the police are not empowered to just shoot anyone willy-nilly as much as they want to or they can. They don't have that right. Unfortunately, some officers express that. And right now, two officers are facing jail time because they've killed someone in Guyana. It came out yesterday in the news. The state does not have the right to torture or to take their life away from someone. And in the case of child molesters, you can isolate them, but they can still contribute in the prison system. And the case of prison systems and justice reform, the crime must match the time you spend in prison. So something like marijuana, I think does not deserve jail time. Petty theft should not be equal to murder. And that's why in the US, there are categories of murders, first degree, second degree, third degree murders. Depending on what the court says, the, um, determines how long you spend in prison. So to wrap up that whole discussion, uh, I don't think laws or they should, law should not be empowered to take the rights away from people. Prisons and the justice system are supposed to suspend your rights, not take it away. It's suspended for a certain amount of time. But for some people, um, the right to freedom can be for life. Um, and even that, they're in prison and they're still allowed to roam around prison a certain amount of time. So the right isn't really exactly taken away completely. It is suspended and it's reduced. So at the end of the day, everyone deserves rights, depending on what they've done and if that right is reduced or if that right is suspended for a time. That does not mean the right is taken away, nor should the rights be taken away. And that goes to everyone, including child molesters. And yes, we had the discussions that they've done something very, very, uh, just, you know, you can't imagine why I would have done that. And that is why I think it's circumstantial. Um, and it is circumstantial for children, you know. For example, in the Juvenile Justice Act of Guyana, children cannot be brought forward um, and cannot be sent to prison. And they're supposed to give, be given all sorts of options other than to hold them into child holding centers. And in that regard, it's always circumstantial. You meet the child, you ask the child why they've done what they've done, and you give the child counseling, and you discuss with the child what they think they can do to be better in society. Why aren't adults given that same freedom? Instead of, okay, you're big enough, so you're supposed to know better. You don't know the circumstances of why people do the things they do. So yes, for example, with rapists, and I'm not defending rapists, some persons, they don't hold any remorse at all. That is true. Other people, they were traumatized as children and they just come, um, just because they've been raped, they're completing the process. Remember, we talk about that cycle of abuse. It's not right, but you should meet with them and say, this is wrong. You need counseling. You're going to be imprisoned. Um, you need to contribute to society and you're going to go for the X amount of years. But we are going to help you through counseling make you understand what you've done and try to do better. Instead of, you are the nastiest person, we're going to throw you into, um, into the prison system, we're going to kill you, we're going to take your life away from you. Which one do you think is going to be better or at least make that person feel remorse and work towards making themselves better in society? Demonizing them and then taking their lives, which people are going to smile and be, yes, they deserve that for what they've done. Or are you going to work with them to be better? 
again, it's well, circumstantial. It depends on why like they have it. done. That working with them, however, it depends why they've done the things they've done. And then in prison, it's supposed to have a system, if we're talking about rights, that will determine, it's called the parole system, the parole process. Do you deserve a shorter sentence? Do you deserve to be released? Or have you shown no remorse or correction that you need more time in prison? We need that in Guyana, particularly, a parole board. Other countries have it, and we need to strengthen that system. So again, you shouldn't paint everyone with the same brush. It should be what you've done and if you feel remorse and if you're working towards bettering yourself for society. Anything else? Anyone want to share? And you can, I um, always say, you can disagree with me and you can place your points down. Okay. Yes, like earlier on, like when you were talking about the whole prison system and stuff, I was going to touch on something that says that um, that actually shows to that the prison system, particularly in the U.S., is just modern day slavery <laughs> because of how many like black black indigenous and people of color are in prison. Um, like so many of them are in prison, they often use it as a way of getting like cheap or free label because even though they have the commission system in place where you can do work for money it's basically little to nothing so they often use the prison system as a modern day form of slavery which is actually a violation of a, a human right which is there should like no slavery mm -hmm. the right to like like the right to freedom yeah. You know, so you need better systems that empower people rather than throw them into a system of uh, economics, of capitalism. That is very much true. Um, and we did touch on, on one of the rights, rights, everyone, freedom from slavery. And then we must consider that there is modern day slavery by human trafficking. And we must, as I said, look in your society, look in your communities of what needs changing, what are violations that needs addressing, and how are we going to work towards making our societies a freer and equal place. Thank you very much for attending your session on an introduction to human rights philosophy. Um, I'll be taking other questions by form of messaging. You can message me about them and I'm going to be sharing content just on um, like the videos and stuff, the links to the videos so that you may watch and just to have a backup of the human rights philosophy. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Um, thank you, Jairo, for teaching us this last minute. It was very informative for something you just put together. So. <laughs> well, remember, this is my career. I, I know I had to compile the information for all of you, but um, I've been working in human rights advocacy for the past six years. And it's, it's a really fulfilling career. And this program is all about empowerment and to empower you, have you educated and be the changers in society. So you two have inspired me to continue the work I'm doing in communities. So thank you for that. Thank you.